Uh, welcome to another Wish Wednesday. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of VIT Sport and Health, the umbrella body for sport and exercise medicine at the Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, VIT University. And we're very pleased to welcome all our stakeholders and, and interest groups to this meeting, uh, where we're going to be showcasing one of our experts in the WISH network, who will be introduced a little bit later. Also, uh, welcome to our SASMA members, South African Sports Medicine Association members from around the, the country. And uh, we have people tuning in from over 20 different countries around the world to this webinar. So we welcome you all. And we also know because of the topic that there's wide interest from various dance groups around the world who may not be awake at the moment, but will be tuning in to our YouTube channel to uh, view this talk a bit later. Uh, so just to tell you, you can go onto the WISH website and access these talks a little bit later if they are missed. In terms of CPD points, wait till the end, uh, fill in the questionnaire and you will have your CPD certificate sent to you. So please make use of that facility. And please become involved in the webinar. Use the question and answer facility on Zoom and please send in your questions and we'll make sure we try and get through as many of them as possible uh, at the end of, of the webinar. So thanks very much to Robin Saggers, uh, who's in the background and helping us with all the technical aspects. Uh, I'm going to sign off now and mute myself. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Brad Galbart, who has a very important role in WISH. He is the clinical director and he actually manages all the interest groups, the 26 different interest groups we have in WISH. And the foot and ankle group is one of those. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to Brad, thank him for his participation and his work and get him to introduce the topic and our very well-informed guest speaker for this evening. So enjoy the webinar. Thank you, John. Um, it really is an honor to be here tonight and well done on this great series of webinars that. Uh, you and Robin have put together. It's an honor to be hosting this and sharing it with my friend and colleague and associate, Professor Nick Saragus, uh, who I work with very closely at the Linksfield Orthopedic um, and Rehab Center, a Sports and Rehab Center. Um, I'm sure to most of you, he needs no introduction, but for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, I'll give you a brief CV. I won't tell you which year he qualifies as a doctor for the first time, um, but he qualified as a specialist in orthopedics in 91, then an MMed, and in 2019 uh, achieved his PhD uh, in foot surgery around the first metatarsal pharyngeal joint. Um, he's currently in uh, private practice. Um, he's the part time consultant and head of the foot and ankle unit at Sarat Macheke Johannesburg Academic Hospital and an active part of the VIT orthopedic department. He is a director of the Foot and Ankle Fellowship for local international candidates and surgeons, which is endorsed by the South African Orthopedic Association. And he's an honorary professor at the University of Advertisement. He's published over 40 papers in local international peer review journals uh, and chapters in books. Um, he's been at many different congresses, presenting, organizing, and traveled around the world speaking on these topics. And is a member of the South African Orthopedic Association, South African Foot Surgeons Association, which is past president, an international member of the American Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society, and a corresponding member of the European Foot and Ankle Society. Um, above all, he's a great guy, and on the side, he's an executive producer of an award-winning documentary. So if you ever want to go into film, uh, you may want to contact him too. Tonight, he's going to entertain us um, for a while on the dancer's feet. Um, I do mainly knees because the foot's very complicated, lots of bones and joints. There's a lot of tendons and ligaments and lots of different things that can go right and wrong. Um, so I'm sure Nick will simplify it for us and put things in perspective, probably for one of the hardest things the foot has to do to get into those positions for dancers. So I'm gonna turn off my video, hide my corona mask, and let Nick talk. I do encourage you guys to please put as many questions as you want into the Q&A. Nick loves answering questions, the harder the better, um, and hopefully we can dig into his wealth of experience in foot and ankle surgery. So 
without further ado, Nick, over to you. Right. Uh, good evening, all. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, Thanks, Nick. Great. Well, thank you very much, Brad, John, Robin, and the WISH, uh, the WISH team for inviting me. Uh, tonight, I'll be uh, talking on foot and ankle injuries in dance, uh, concentrating primarily uh, on ballet. Um, sorry, this uh, got stuck a bit. There we go. So with the, the dance is ballet, modern, Broadway, jazz, tap, folk, or ethnic, places unique stresses on the body. And of all the dance forms, ballet is the most stringent for the, for the dancers. Ballet, as you well are aware, is an exquisitely sophisticated and elegant art form. This beautiful photograph shows us. It's seeming ease and grace though. Belie the great strength and physical strain of the body as a whole and the foot and ankle in particular. Basically, to reach this stage of grace and elegance, there are plenty of injuries, despondency and disappointment. Dancers' feet are equivalent to musicians' hands. The foot is a unique structure and the result of years of endless training, as many of our dancers know, and often leads to this foot. Note the callosities. I will talk about these later. A dancer's foot is quite strong and yet flexible. And this flexibility occurs over, over, over many years. As all our ladies know, often um, a young ballet dancer starts at a very young age so that the, the immature skeleton molds as it grows. Um, just look at the, the bottom part of this slide. The, the, the callosities develop in appropriate areas and this is really quite uh, a protective mechanism for the foot. And uh, often dancers don't want you to touch those calluses. I may be wrong, but uh, so dancers tell me. Out of interest, five types of dancers' feet have been described. The Grecian foot or the Morton's foot being the most common one, and that is a relatively long second toe. The Egyptian foot is the opposite, a long foot, a great toe. Then the simian foot or the congenital varus of the first middle tarsal. The peasant's foot, a rather square foot with the three middle toes quite stubby and almost the same length. Then the model's foot, a nice cascade of the toes. Uh, which one do you think would be the most appropriate for a dancer? Well, the peasant's foot is the most sturdy and the most stable that makes a good dancer's foot. Now, as all other athletes, dancers can sustain a multitude of injuries, as one can see here and there. Now, for me to go through all these, we need a few months. So I've, uh, I've picked a few which are more common in the ballet dancer by virtue of their unique uh, postures and position. So I'll be covering sesamoid injuries, stress fractures, posterior ankle impingement, Achilles tendonitis, and heel pain. Now, each of these topics uh, is a whole webinar in itself. So I'll, uh, I will not skim the surface, but I will just pick other salient features. Right, let's start with the sesamoids. The sesamoids or the hallucinal sesamoids are small sesamoid, uh, at least sesame looking structures on the plant aspect of the first metatarsal head. They're very important and there are several uh, tendons are attached, the ligaments, um, stabilizing the first epijoint, and also are very important in the position of the great toe. Um, being sesamoids develop within a tendon, in this case, the flexor hallucis brevis tendon. 
they often have an amazing ability to heal. And just see if uh, you could look at the bottom uh, point, they're, they're often bipartite. This is very important um, as one can easily confuse a bipartite sesamoid to a fracture. There are several features one looks at and I will uh, go through them with you. So a stress fracture of the sesamoid, the main symptom is pain. It worsens with weight bearing as expected, very specific location, whether it's medial or lateral. Movement of the great toe at the MP joint is decreased by virtue of the pain. And uh, besides the clinical features, one can x-ray, one can scan, uh, or an MRI scan. Now the x-ray will show you this appearance. Now, yes, one could say, is this bipartite, which can occur up to about 15, 16% of the population. But if you look at it carefully, you can see that the, the fracture line is rather irregular. It's not this nice rounded off segment as one sees in a bipartite sesamoid. In this case, the medial uh, sesamoid is, uh, is fractured. This is now, of course, beyond a stress fracture. This is now a full-blown fracture. If one does a CT scan, one can see it quite clearly. An MRI scan, even more. And here, one can see also the, um, how it lights up the area uh, that's fractured. Again, another distinguishing feature from a bipartite sesamoid. The treatment is primarily non-operative. As I mentioned earlier, um, the sesamoid has great healing ability. So initially, it's the usual symptomatic treatment of rest, ice, compression. Most importantly, modification of activities and training. Now, obviously, one doesn't want to go on to a demi point or point with uh, sesamoids that are injured. And then we can even put them in a boot or a cast if it's really, really severe. Now, dancers' felt pads can be bought over the counter or they can be um, made by our podiatrists. Um, all it does really is to offload the sesamoids until, until they heal, until they're asymptomatic. There's no place for hydrocortisone injections. It really is not going to help at all. And if after a, a, a reasonable period of, um, of conservative treatment or up to a point that one sees there is a, a non-union, um, normally one considers surgery. As much as possible, we'd like to salvage the sesamoids with uh, internal fixation and bone grafting. A sesamoidectomy uh, can cause a 10% uh, push-off strength loss. And this can be, of course, very important for a ballet dancer. Stress fracture of the second metatarsal, another common um, injury we see with ballet dancers. Uh, there are various reasons for that. The second metatarsal base in particular, uh, often the foot is a cavus foot, the, the long second metatarsal as we spoke about, the Grecian foot or the Greek foot, Morton's foot. And of course, the proximal end of this metatarsal is fixed. You don't want it to come to this, where you already developed a non-union. This will require surgery which can be quite, quite, well, not quite devastating for the dancer, but will, will miss quite a bit of, uh, of dancing, possibly a whole season. Right there, one, one can see the sclerotic edges, clearly, the, visibly, the line, the fracture line. So, in the stress fracture then, we want to protect this foot in a boot for four to six weeks. We can use bone stimulators, and we can still maintain conditioning by non-weight bearing or impact exercises such as swimming. Fracture through the base of the fifth metatarsal, that can be a bit more pro problematic. The Jones fracture is the ugly one. If it's not, if it's not diagnosed early, it can lead to non-union. And we have to be very aggressive with uh, healing or with uh, protecting this fracture in non-weight bearing costs for six, uh, up, to th up to three months. And again, this can be quite quite devastating uh, for a, a professional dancer. So if we divide the base of the 
fifth metatarsally to three. The middle zone or the second zone is where one finds a Jones fracture, where the fracture line extends not into the cuboid metatarsal articulation, but the intermetatarsal articulation. More distally, we're looking at stress fractures now of the shaft. So it's not a Jones fracture. And they all heal quite well, besides this Jones fracture, unless identified early, one can miss the boat and you land up with a non-union and you can land up with um, open reduction fixation with bone grafting. The other fracture one sees in the, in the, in the ballet dancer or in the dancer is a spiral fracture of the distal shaft of the fifth metatarsal. We, we often call it a dancer's fracture. And that heals quite well in the castor boot. Of course, if all that fails, one does have to operate, and this is what it will look like. Uh, before I carry on, a, a, a rather a gross omission from the injuries which I'm presenting is, of course, the ankle sprain. Now, the ankle sprain in itself can take us a whole weekend to discuss, so I left this out for this time round. Right, then we look at the tibia. Let's start with the shin splints. What is a shin splint? Many call it attraction periostitis. Uh, usually, unlike the stress fracture, it's over a, a longer area. It can be anterior or posterior borders of the tibia. And it's often in the beginning of the season when we, we get a bit overzealous and do too much too soon. Push the dancer. The stress fracture of the tibia, usually an overloading problem, and usually mid-season. And the so-called dreaded black line, we don't want to see, and because that takes a long time to heal. And this is what it looked like in the tibia. Posterior ankle impingement syndrome has, was well covered by my good friend, colleague, and associate, Dr. Farrell, some weeks back. And I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but I think it's important to cover it as it is a, a common problem one sees in the ballet dancer. Often is, used, is, is due to a large posterior ta tailor tubercle, the starter process, or an ostrogonum, which we find in about 10% of the population. Now, this is the bony cause of the posterior ankle impingement. And usually, this fragment of bone, the ostrogonum, or the large posterior process, gets crushed between the posterior tibia and the calcaneus. So here you can clearly see this uh, triangular piece of bone behind the talus. And when the ballet dancer plantar flexes the ankle, you can see how it gets jammed between the tibia and the calcaneus. And that causes a lot of irritation, bruises that part of the bone, causes synovitis, inflammation, and pain with plantar flexion. Incidentally, another group of uh, athletes who uh, develop this problem are the fast bowlers in cricket. Because if one extrapolates the leading foot in a bowler, essentially he hyperplantar flexes just as much as a ballet dancer does. Interesting. All right, here we go. Now, grammatically, this is what happens to the posterior part of the ankle joint. So the tenderness there is at the back of the ankle behind the peroneal tendon. So it's more posterior lateral. And of course, what gives it away is the pain with forced plantar flexion. So this is what we do, and, the, and our dancer experiences quite a bit of pain. So again, this is pretty much a clinical diagnosis. Um, an x-ray, if there is a, a bony component to this problem, will be obvious. If we inject a local anesthetic and the pain goes away completely, it's pretty much diagnostic. A bone scan can be of use, but it's quite expensive. And of course, if it's a, a soft tissue component for serious um, ankle impingement, i.e., when there is no obvious stider process or there's no obvious ostrogonum, then what causes this posterior ankle impingement? It's probably crushing of the synovium at the back or even a flexohalusis longus tendonitis, which I will discuss now. Then an MRI becomes quite useful. The treatment, once again, we start off with the conservative management with some physiotherapy, of course, a low-heeled shoe. Um, we don't want to plant a flex 
the ankle, obviously. Activity modification, try and avoid standing on toes. Hydrocortisone injection is good as long as you make absolutely sure that you inject in the posterior ankle area and not in the flexor hallucis longus tendon. If it's very severe, we can put a cast on for a short period of time or even a boot. And if nothing helps, then surgery is warranted, but you have to warn the dancer that they can only return to dance about two to three months later. And in fact, the dorsiflexion can take uh, quite long to recover fully, up to about three months. You must be aware of that. So just to show you some surgery, this, although the, the problem is more posterior lateral, we like to go medially so that we can identify the neurovascular bundle. And of course, once we uh, retract it, as you can see on the bottom part of this incision, we see this muscle belly. This muscle belly is a flexor hallucis longus tendon and often has a low lying muscle belly, which can also become involved in this posterior ankle impingement. Of course, flexor hallucis longus tendonitis as well. So we tend to debride it, make, inspect the tendon, make sure the tendon is in good order and, and there's not nodules or nodules uh, that affect it, no tears. And then we retract that out of the way and we fall onto the posterior part of the ankle. And what you're looking there, pointed by the scissors, is the um, ostragonum. And very carefully we shell it out and it can be quite large. So the soft tissue component of, uh, of posterior uh, ankle impingement, and also in its own right, flexor hallucis longus tendonitis, or the dancer's tendonitis, uh, also known as the Achilles tendon of the foot for the dancer. And often the tendonitis uh, occurs behind the medial malleolus, and it can become quite inflamed, and once it becomes chronic, you can start uh, uh, getting stuck down on the surrounding tissue, it can even prevent, can even prevent movement of the gray toe. So it can sometimes seize up completely and creates a pseudo hallux rigidus. Or it can trigger the, the gray toe, just like we get with a trigger finger or trigger thumb. Treatment, again, you'll get, uh, uh, get out of me saying it. Always we start off with conservative treatment with appropriate rest, again, modification of activities. Uh, that is obviously no, no point work or debit point work. Give some non-steroid inflammatory agents. Here you avoid steroid injections. In fact, don't give steroid injections because you can cause harm to the tendon. And if all else fails, we do a tenolysis as I showed you earlier. So this is what can happen sometimes with the flexor hallucis longus tendon. You can create this little nodule. And this nodule can get caught in the sheath and can cause a trigger gray toe. It can cause quite a bit of pain. So we go in there, we uh, remove all the necrotic material and we repair the tendon. Next, I'd like to cover Achilles tendonitis. There are two varieties. We have the non-insertional and the insertional. And as the name implies, the non-insertional is a few centimeters above the insertion into the, the calcaneal tuberosity in the so-called uh, watershed area where the vascularity is not terribly good. And that's usually due to repetitive um, overload, excessive stresses. We know that the Achilles tendon is the strongest tendon in the body. If you're running upstairs or, or you jump, it takes up to four to six the body weight. For the purest, you can start off with the peritonitis and then lead on to a, a, a tendinosis. The severe form, is quite slow to heal and can be very, very debilitating for the dancer. There are a couple of predisposing factors. Heel cord tightness, that's where the importance of stretching um, takes place. Sometimes there can be a congenitally small or thin Achilles tendon predisposing to non insertional Achilles tendonitis. Then you have a specific problem with ballet dancers known as the ribbon burn, which is pretty self explanatory. And there are a couple of modifications uh, that ballet dancers do to try and prevent this. By, if I recall, they put elastic bands around there to try and prevent this constant friction. 
Pronation of the foot, this is really technique. The dancer tries to externally rotate more than they can, so they pronate the foot in order to achieve that, putting a lot of strain on the Achilles tendon as well. And of course, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it a tight uh, um, Achilles that's causing the pronation or the pronation causing the, uh, the tight Achilles? Then we have the insertion of Achilles tendonitis. This we often see in a cavus foot, uh, and often there's an associated a Hagland deformity. Right, that is the, the attachment of the Achilles tendon now into the tuberosity of those calces. You've all seen this, the so-called pump bump from the ladies' pumps. That's where the heel counter rubs up against that area. So generally treatment for these Achilles tendonitis is in two phases. Initially, we allow the tendon to heal, excuse me, the spelling, uh, and then the rehab and correction of the predisposing factors. So technique is extremely important. And then we concentrate on restoring strength and flexibility. The New York City Ballet and American Ballet Theater have come up with the stretch box, which again, it's pretty simple, quite effective and quite self-explanatory. Again, no hydrocortisone injection. Um, this is not a quick fix. The more times one injects cortisone into this tendon, the tendon will ultimately rupture. And some of the, the worst degenerative tendons I have seen, not just Achilles tendon, but tibias posterior tendon, plexus hallucis longus tendon, peroneal tendons, is from repeated intratendinous hydrocortisone injections. If you want to Give, some, uh, give a hydrocortisone injection under ultrasound control into the sheath, perhaps with a fine needle, but please try and avoid hydrocortisone injections in tendons. So if there's no improvement, give it two, three months, four months. As long as there's improvement, you carry on. If not, then of course, um, there is surgery, which I'm not going to elaborate. Um, suffice it to say that the non-insertional tendonitis, they heal much faster because it's purely a debridement and repair of the tendon. Uh, one does a synovectomy, uh, decompresses the tendon by opening the sheath. Uh, sometimes the, the um, plantaris is at fault, so we resect uh, part of it. Whereas the insertional tendonitis is bony work as well. We have to detach the attachment of the uh, Achilles tendon to a certain degree to get to this posterior superior prominence, which we resect. We clean out the retrocranial bursa, um, debride the deep surface of the Achilles tendon where it's been frayed by rubbing up against this bone. And then we have to reattach the Achilles tendon and give it enough time to heal in a cast for approximately uh, four weeks and then go into a boot while they start physio and biokinetics for a period of time. So it's not a quick fix. <clears throat> Let me uh, end off by covering heel pain. Again, plantar fasciitis. Now, again, this can take us a, a weekend to discuss it. Um, plantar fasciitis is the headache of the foot. It's very, very common problem and a hell of a stubborn problem to settle and to heal. It can take months, in fact, sometimes years, if it's not dealt with properly. The so-called cacaneal or the inferior cacaneal spur, it's not necessarily the cause of, this, of the heel pain, the plantar fasciitis is. The other problem is this rupture of a plantar fascia. Again, just with tendons, multiple steroid injections can cause this. So plantar fasciitis needs TLC. Um, 80, 90, 95% of it is due to overloading overuse, so we need to give it adequate rest. And rest and rest. So stick to the daily activities, which our daily lives is quite hectic anyway. So don't add on top of that uh, running and sport and other extramural activities. All right, um, cushion the heel with a little heel cushion, stretch the Achilles tendon. There is, there is a, an association between a heel, heel cord tightness or a gastroc tightness and, uh, and um, um, plantar fasciitis. And of course, the other modalities like shockwave therapy, uh, hydrocortisone injection or uh, platelet rich plasma injections and so on. But most importantly, the patient must understand, at least the, the patient or the, the dancer must understand the problem 
explain to them the problem, uh, tell them they have to be compliant. This is a shotgun therapy. It's not just one isolated modality and patients. It can take up to four, five, six months before it settles down. And only then, after exhausting all other possibilities, do we consider surgery, which in itself is not an overnight quick fix either. So this is the plantar fascia. It's quite it's a, a, a ligament looking structure attached to the medial tuberosity of those calces, not exactly on that spur that people see on an X-ray. It's quite a large uh, structure. It's, it's one of the structures which maintain the medial arch. So it goes along the medial arch and then fans onto the toes. But it's only that area that you see in red, about two thirds of the medial insertion, that with repeated loading and strain, you, one develops micro tears. The tears try to heal with scar tissue. The scar tissue um, excites an inflammatory response and they get pain. So this is the area if one needs to operate on, one would like to release of the um, attachment and in fact often have to resect a centimeter or so of it. And the rupture is more, more distal. So then to conclude, we need to understand more clearly the appropriate use of weight bearing, early motion and functional resistance. That's where our physios and our biokinesis come in. Every injury has a position that must be protected and an opposite motion that must be rehabilitated. Remember that every week of immobilization will add two weeks to rehabilitation. So we, so we don't take lightly putting um, these, these high performance athletes into casts and boots indefinitely. And, uh, and often you get asked, let's operate, a quick fix. You know, good surgery that is fully rehabilitated will equal a poor result. So surgery is not always the answer. And many times I tell my patients, surgery is 50% of the success. The other 50% is the aftercare. The dancer, as with any other athlete, will desire and often demand 100% strength, 100% motion, and 100% function as soon as possible. That can be quite stressful to the treating person. These are just a few of the books that you might like to, to look at where they cover all these sporting injuries in much more detail. And of course, the many others that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, in view of the time constraints, obviously we can't cover more, I would love to, but I can, I can open up the, the webinar to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof Saragas. Uh, that was a very comprehensive overview of massive subjects, which, as you quite rightly said, we normally spend days and weekends debating the right and wrong ways, but it's a great start. Before we get on to some very interesting questions that I have lined up for you, um, I just want to thank our sponsors, um, Lita and Asino, without whom tonight's event couldn't uh, have happened. Thank you for sponsoring WISH and our webinars and ensuring that we can bring this free of charge to everybody that's listening tonight. So thank you very much. So we'll start off um, where you started, on the sesamoid fractures. And I have a question that's asking, what is the estimated healing time for a stress fracture of the sesamoid bone of the helix? Well, min minimum of six weeks, be non-weight bearing, but it can take a bit longer than that. Um, the important thing is don't allow it to go into a a complete fracture that with, the, with the possibility of a vascular necrosis. With, I mean, I didn't, come across, I didn't speak about a vascular necrosis as well, um, or, a, or a non union in each case you will need surgery. So give it the best chance in the beginning. Diagnose it early, offload it at least six weeks. It may take longer. Now, many times you spoke, uh, particularly for the... Um, for the patients about what I call that four letter swear word for the sportsman and dancers are sportsmen. The four letter swear word is rest. And they always look for things to get them back quicker. Yeah. Now, hydrocortisone's often been something that we use 
effectively to dull the pain, decrease inflammation, if there is any, and get them back to going. And I see you don't like it very much and you try and avoid it. Do you use any other methods like PRP, stem cells, um, or anything else that may return to their activities quicker? Well, let's go back to hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone, as I mentioned earlier, in tendons and in the, in the plantar fascia is a no-no. Um, you may get away with one, maybe two, but continuing that, you run the risk of rupture, degeneration, and then that might be career ending. All right, now cortisone in other areas, uh, for example, plantar fasciitis, yes, I would give it uh, uh, often once off. We know that about 50% of patients, you'll have uh, long-term relief, otherwise the, the, the problem will come back. And there've been many studies comparing it to PRP, and of course they are the, the protagonists and uh, antagonists of using PRP, but there are studies that have shown that PRP is probably more effective for plantar fasciitis um, long-term. After a year, they're still pain-free. In other parts of the foot, including Achilles tendon or peroneal tendons and so on, it hasn't shown to be very effective. Okay. Now, cortisone, yes, it will dull the pain, but hasn't stopped the progression of the problem. All right? So you'll still, if you have a, a tendonitis, um, say proceed ankle impingement, you'll give your cortisone, but you still got this impingement problem. You know, so, so rather, rather treat the problem. Um, I, I realize that, that some of our, our um, soccer players overseas, you know, one day is about a million euros or something. Yes, I understand the, the urgency of going back to playing, but but if this is not done properly, in fact, the long-term uh, problems will be much more, much more uh, uh, um, deleterious to the, to, the, to the athlete. What, what do I mean by rest? I use rest here generically. Okay, as I mentioned, one of, one of the, the slides, um, rest from the, the activity that causes the pain. For example, the procedural impingement, you know, they can still maintain their fitness by, by performing or, or exercising in a way not to plant a flex the ankle and causing the problem. And that's where the bacchinesis come in, the physios come in, all right? Swim, or for example, you, want, you don't want to, to, uh, uh, to, to load the foot, so the foot's bruised, let's call it the, heel fat pad bruising, for example, uh, then you can go and, and swim or do something different that you don't load the foot unnecessarily. So maybe by, what I mean by rest. So there's always something one can do without causing further damage. And pain is a good indicator. If they do something and it's painful, you know, it's not a nice sensation. So why do we have pain? We have pain because our body's saying, listen, you're doing something wrong. I don't like it. So stop doing it. You do something, you've got no pain. It's probably okay to maintain the fitness and the, uh, the strength and other requirements for the particular profession. Do, do you see a role for PRP and stem cells um, for the overuse type injuries? And inflammatory I don't have much experience with, uh, with stem cells um, at all. In fact, I have no experience with stem cells, um, but PRP in the foot, I use it for plantar fasciitis only. I was using it for various other conditions, uh, but I didn't find it very uh, effective, and that was pretty much in keeping with the, with the international literature. Okay, great. So I have a tough question from uh, one of the Greek sports physicians. <laughs> he, wants, he wants to know um, that dreaded black line in the tibial stress fracture. Yes. Have you got an approach to that? Yes, again, we rested. <laughs> the, I, don't, I don't put them in costs. So would, they've, got to be, they've got to use crutches, offload the area. After about eight weeks, it can take. After about eight weeks. Is there any room for surgery if it's not getting better? Um, I don't recall ever have to 
do any surgery. Or maybe once, maybe once I had to, um, to nail a tibia because it was not getting better. You know, bone grafted, nail it. Uh, but the vast majority, it doesn't need surgery. Just give it enough time, offload it, use crutches. No need to put in a cast or a boot. That sounds like a great surgeon's answer. And for the physicians out there, I'm sure you want to do bloods and look at all the other uh, oh, metabolic right. factors as well. Okay. Um, but we surgeons, <laughs> you like to all put right. nails in things. It's operator right. or not. You, 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 you <laughs> caught me out. Okay. Yeah. I, don't know, I wasn't trying to catch all you. Of just the, all of the above. All right. I know the, I know the, the follow-up's going to come just now. Um, so just let's cover that quickly. We've got a few, a few questions on the Achilles tendon. Yes. Yeah, so let's just, if we can focus on those for a few minutes. So the first thing I suppose we'll start at the end um, is the ruptured Achilles tendon. Yes. So I see a psychologist is asking us, um, a young dancer or dancer ruptured it during a performance. Uh, they want to understand the different stages in rehabilitation. So firstly, would you, would you fix it? Would you operate? And then how would you rehabilitate them? And right. while you're thinking about your answer, uh, we've got a few discussions on shockwave therapy um, for keratinitis and rehab. Um, and um, there was something else that I was seeing. And, and they, therefore exercises to strengthen once it's healed. And they probably could double up for Achilles tendonitis. If you could just try and address that okay. in a general way. Okay, for rupture, for acute rupture of the Achilles tendon, um, there are two schools of thought the surgery and the non-surgical. If you catch the rupture within, within three days, yes, one can attempt to treat it, to treat it non-surgically. The problem there though is that, in my view, the results are not as predictable. And, the, and it's been shown also that the re-rupture rate is higher in the, in the non-surgical non group. Um, yes, you do avoid the potential risk of surgery, but I don't think that is a deterrent. So I'm so clearly I'm of the of the surgical school because I know what I'm doing. Okay, not in a not in a, a facetious sense, but, but what I mean is I I open the the rupture site. I take the one end. I take the other end put them together, I create the correct tension that all um, the gastrosoleus complex has, all right? And then I suture it with non, at least with absorbable material, and this absorbable material in due course will disappear, and then the tendon will be the tendon, repaired end to end, and, um, and the chance of re-rupture, provided the, the patient follows the rules, is, is negligible compared to the, to the, um, the, non, the non-surgical group. So I'm of, the, I'm of the school of surgically repairing the Achilles tendon, having discussed in detail the pros and cons with, with the patient. Um, the patients may refuse to have a surgery, in which case it's fine. I, I, I still give my opinion, but, the, but the, the decision is finally the patient's. All right. Um, I like to use absorbable because this foreign material will ultimately dissolve. Um, as over the years, most of the of the tendonitis I see from previous ruptures is cleaning out the tendon from non-absorbable material like ethibond and all sorts of other synthetic stuff. Um, so once I've, I've operated on the tendon and I repaired it as I normally do, they, I put them in a, in a baloney, non-weight bearing cast with the foot in equinus for about 25, 30 degrees for four weeks. All right, then I remove the, the, the cast and they go into a boot, a moon boot, a long moon boot with uh, two wedges to accommodate for the equinus that they had for four weeks. And I keep a boot on for six weeks. The first two weeks, I keep two um, wedges. The following two weeks, one wedge, and then there are no wedges in the moon boot. During that time, 
they go to physiotherapy and they dorsiflex to neutral, not beyond neutral for the six weeks. All right, and after, after the six weeks in the boot, now we're talking about 10 weeks from the time of the surgery, you will go into a, an ordinary uh, shoe with two centimeter heels for about two to three months. While at that stage, they start now dorsiflexing beyond neutral and with biokinetics um, guidance to what they can and can't do. So at six months, generally, they will go back to their usual activities. All goes well. Now, there are various ways of, of repairing the tendon. Now we have the, the, the um, various techniques with mini, mini incisions. Um, again, I wasn't brought up with that. Um, I do it open and my incision is not very much longer than the incisions used with the various uh, other um, gadgets available that one does them percutaneously almost. Um, the so-called accelerated rehabilitation, I don't do. Uh, generally, these require non-absorbable material, which I'm very much against, unless things have changed. Again, I've, what I've been doing over the years worked very well. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, if, if a week earlier makes a big difference um, financially, well, then perhaps one would go more for the accelerated type of, uh, of technique. But I must say, I haven't had this problem yet. Are, are there any specific exercises that you would encourage a patient with Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy or post acute tendon repair um, to help strengthen and rehab that tendon? I think initially, look, I leave this to my physicians and the bios. They're the experts there than I do. But, uh, but besides the, I advise them the, the, the period of non weight bearing or non weight bearing type of movement and exercise, I leave it up to the physicians and the bios. Perhaps uh, one of our physicians, but I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of various um, techniques that they use as well, uh, depending on how they've grown up. So I think the, the first um, law of a great medical practitioner in whatever field we are is to know our limitations and know who the experts are. So I think that's a great answer, Prof. And similarly, to just to answer my question earlier on the stress fractures, we had a, a question um, that's come up here about the role of, uh, it's been answered now, metabolic effects on amenorrhea in stress fractures. And I, I, I think we, we would refer it to sports physicians to deal with. Oh, most, def most definitely, most definitely, most definitely. I mean, I certainly give vitamin D. I normally, um, as we know, despite the uh, uh, sunny skies in Chevrolet, if you remember the old, uh, the old uh, advert, um, we're not much out in the sun. And if we are, we put so much block that we don't really get the effects of vitamin D. And in fact, the vast majority of my, my surgical patients are either deficient or insufficient vitamin D. And I normally would give vitamin D to these patients. Now, when it comes to the amenorrhea and other possible endocrine problems, then I would, I, I, I would ask the, the sports physician to say that. Great, so I'm gonna close that one. Um, just, there was a question from Lorenzo um, and he asked, are your protocols that you use for your post-surgical rehab standardized or are they your specific? And are they becoming more standardized throughout the foot surgery world? Initially, they may have been standardized, but there is one against experience, and from personal experience, one sees what works and what doesn't. And, and with time, one adapts to various situations. So I, I, can't, I can't say categorically whether they are standardized now or not. Um, I mean, obviously, some of them are, like to keep somebody off the system, for example, offloaded, uh, say compared to Achilles tendon management, you know, Achilles tendon rupture management. So that partly is my experience and I, I added perhaps uh, uh, certain aspects to it, but I, I'm not quite sure what, what I'm doing is still standard compared to someone else. Um, I mean, I know for, it's for, for a fact that, well, say for a fact, but uh, Dr. Farah, my associate, would keep the, the Aquinas 
foot in the boot a bit longer than I do. Because we do know, and it's been shown, that over the next six months or so, there's, uh, there is some stretching of the repair. Um, now, whether that, is, whether that is important after six months or so, I, I don't know. I don't think so, because majority of the patients at six months, normally they would go back to, uh, back to, uh, to doing the, the various sports. Great. I want to change tack for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how many pediatrics you deal with, but there are lots of questions on on-point positioning. And when is the right time to start it? How old should they be? Um, should they, can it be from 10 years old? Should they be adolescents? Um, what of, what, of what I, I heard from, from, from uh, various people when they go to high school, probably around 12. All right. So you you happy with them getting up on those toes? And do they have any growth deformities after that? Do you think that leads to any other major problems? I, I don't think so. Look, uh, I mean, we know that uh, that girls would pretty much stop growing at around 14. So there's no, I don't think there's a danger of any growth deformities at that stage. Um, so in view of that, perhaps start points at 14. Perhaps it's safer, but of course, the younger they start, the other problems will be developing in time, as, as I showed you the one slide of the bunions and the callosities and the hematos and all other you, problems. You can fix that. As long as they've got a great dance career when they're younger and they achieve high goals, yeah. we can sort it out later. Later, much later. Good. <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, can do, do you see a difference with ballroom and Latin dancers in terms of the injuries that they get compared to ballerinas? Uh, not really. You know, the ballroom dancers have the very, the very high stiletto heels. And they, and they do also, also have a problem with uh, pretty much the same as ballet dancers. Anything from the, the heel, heel problems to the bunions to the... Uh, the plantar fasciitis to ankle sprains, they fall off these uh, stilettos, which we haven't covered. Not, not, not very different uh, to, to the ballet dancers. But I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but, um, but I think ballet dancers, they are, they're, they're, the training is far more, far more um, stringent and far more uh, intense, perhaps, than the ballet dancers, and, and, on, and mainly on on the toes, I don't know, I might, I might be wrong. Um, but but I, think the, I think the injuries are pretty much, pretty much similar, or oh, the stress fractures and so on, pretty much similar, you know, weight-bearing areas more so. We, we have a few podiatrists who want to know what their role is in the dancer's foot and whether you use them or not. Oh, plenty, they know very well I use them, the ones that I, <laughs> that I know well, Sean being one of them in Cape Town now and a lot of uh, a local, uh, a local podiatrists. Um, offloading particularly of areas, fluxes and modats and so on are very important. Um, I do realize that ballet shoes don't, don't have the room to put in uh, orthotics and things, but certainly in between with, um, any malalignment can try and correct when they're not dancing and not wearing the, they're not wearing the, um, the ballet shoes, and uh, and other general care on the foot, if, if as as required, I think podiatrists are, are very important. Um, so, great. So we've got lots of questions coming through, and uh, we'll keep on going probably for another ten minutes or so. We'll keep Prof yeah. in the hot shot chair. I've sure. got an interesting question that I don't know the answer to from Ken Kabonga. He says, what's your take on the Alfredson rehab protocol versus suburginal rehab protocol from a surgeon's point of view? Do you know I don't is? know these pro I don't know these protocols. Maybe I know them by, by different names or no names at all. Okay. I, so I, Ken, I if you can let me know which, uh, which procedure they're related to, that would help us. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, what about um, Liz Frank? injuries and repairs and return to activity in dancers. Do you have experience with that? And 
What are your thoughts? Normally, in dancers, in dancers, we would see the, the so-called low-velocity type of, of this flank injuries. Mm -hmm. um, generally, generally, again, the, the crux, is it stable, is it unstable? If it's stable, we would treat conservatively. If it's unstable, we would need to, to stabilize um, various ways. So I, I must say, I, I, don't, I don't, don't see too many, I can't even remember when I lost a list injury. You know, unlike, unlike the, the football player or the American football player where the, the foot or the ankle is, is plantar flexed and the, the toes are dorsiflexed and you have a, a, a heavy opponent falling on the heel, uh, causing damage to, to the list frank joint and, and even the, 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 the turf toe and so on. With, with ballet dancers, I would think more landing awkwardly could cause a problem. So it would be more the low velocity. And majority of them, I would think, would be stable. Obviously, one would have to check that and would treat conservatively. Okay. And if someone's had a Liz Frank fixation, would you leave the hardware in for longer? Or no, usually about four months, I would leave it in and remove them. Yeah, you know, again, with a low velocity, unstable, one wouldn't want to go and do primary fusions. Um, just sort out the, the list rank uh, ligament and put a cross, a cross plate, a bridging plate, and remove that um, after about four months or thereabouts. Okay, so Ken's come back to us. He says, Alfredson is a eccentric only rehabilitation from Achilles tendinopathy. Mm. This is what, what my, my physios have le led me to believe that um, of all the other modalities, the eccentric rehabilitation for a non-insertional Achilles tendinitis is most effective. Then yes, I do use that, or I request it, but my physios know about it anyway. All right, fantastic. Um, plantar plate tears and neuromas. How do you think distinguish between the two and what do you think, in your opinion, is your best treatment for those? Neuroma would be between the metatarsals. That's where the interdigital nerve runs. Classically in the third web space, about 60% and about 40% in the second web space. Normally, the, 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 um, the profile of such a patient is a middle-aged lady, usually. That's how it's been originally described. But now with our uh, sports meds, South Africa, we do see it across the board, much younger people as well, but still majority are in the middle-aged um, ladies. Most imp important distinguishing feature is the location of the tenderness. With a neuroma, it's between the metatarsal heads. With a plantar plate, is the joint itself that is very painful, and when you stress it, it's even more painful, even, and even unstable sometimes. Um, we can give a a local injection of anesthetic in the, in the web space that should get rid of the pain completely, but will not get rid of the pain in the, in the, in the joint and vice versa. If we inject the joint where the, the, the plantar plate is torn, then the pain should go away. And then of course, you've got the, the ultrasounds and the MRI scans as well. But I think, I think these, are, these are quite obvious clinical diagnoses or Quite obvious, but 80, 90 percent, I think you can, you can pretty much isolate the problem. What is the, the, the treatment again? We always start with the, with the conservative treatment. With neuromas, um, the plantar, or rather the, the metatarsal bar that's been described, makes good sense, theoretically, by lifting the metatarsal heads, splaying the metatarsal heads, you allow more space for the nerve, but practically we don't find it to be very effective. So rather modify your activities, wear a broad shoe, a tight shoe will squeeze that nerve and rather wear something broad and deep and comfortable. A cortisone injection, again, may or may not be helpful depending on the size of the neuroma. If you're looking at a relatively small neuroma, say it's five millimeters, under five millimeters, you can expect a cortisone injection to last up to about six months and a larger neuroma up to about six weeks. So really, will this last indefinitely? And what the cortisone does is basically shrink the inflamed bursa around the nerve, but the structural damage to the nerve, obviously the cortisone won't do anything. 
So ultimately and definitively, surgical excision may have to be the answer. The, the plantar plate tear, again, it, it depends on how bad it is, one grades it. The most severe ones, you may have to go in and repair. Um, otherwise, if the demands on the patient is not great, you can treat them symptomatically till the pain goes and leave it at that. All right. A, a few more short, sharp questions to you. The first one um, is a runner presenter with FHL tendonitis. We're going to the back of the ankle and it's recurrent. Where would you look biomechanically to correct this? I think first you must wait until the symptoms, the symptoms um, resolve. Or just look at the Achilles tendonitis. Then you start continuing the rehabilitation to regain right. the strength primarily. While we're in that compartment, are there any clinical pearls regarding the management of post tendinopathy? Um, to, you, you mean to, to treat tendinopathy? Yeah, clinical yeah. pearls. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> back to resting and modifying activities. An arch support because um, you want to, to relax this, this uh, um, to post tendon um, before it, it progresses to a dysfunctional tendon. So an arch support is important. In the beginning, they may require a boot or a cast, non steroid inflammatory agents, local um, anti-inflammatory modalities, and give it time. Um, that would be to, to protect it from, from deteriorating. Now, Give it eight, month, uh, eight weeks at the most, three months of this treatment. If you find that you're not winning, having diagnosed it, obviously clinically, and if you're not sure, an ultrasound or an MRI scan, then rather opt for surgery. At that stage, the so-called stage one to person dysfunction, one would just debride the tendon and they do very well. Once you start having a dysfunctional tendon going to stage two, stage three, when there's already a deformity, the the flat foot, the, the head of the quiet flat foot, then it's a little bit late to try and salvage the tendon. Then you're looking at other procedures. So the important thing here is early diagnosis and prevent progression um, to, the dam to damage uh, this, this, uh, this tendon. All right, we're almost at the end. Um, and I'm gonna just a couple more. There's a few on plantar fasciitis. Yes. Your, just your thoughts on strengthening and stretching versus shockwave therapy, um, versus a hormonal link. Okay, it is such a common problem, this, this plantar fasciitis, as I mentioned earlier, the headache of the foot, um, that I normally divide my, my treatment in three stages. My first stage is purely, let's call it non-invasive, all right? So if you know that 90, 90% of the times is due to overloading and overuse, we rest from any, any uh, um, activity beyond, beyond daily activities, all right? Um, that's imperative. Whatever you do, unless you rest the foot, it's not gonna come right. I normally would like to cushion the heel with an off-the-shelf heel cushion. We need some anti-inflammatories to break this inflammatory cycle. And then stretching is terribly important. So embryologically, there's a connection between the the heel cord and the plantar fascia. And in adult life, this becomes very rudimentary, but there's a definite association between a tight, tight um, a heel cord or, or primarily the gastro component to it and plantar fasciitis. In fact, we, it's been a study recently we, we, we did um, that we found this association. It's, it's certainly there. So stretching is terribly, terribly important. So we're looking at rest, we're looking at some non steroid inflammatory agents, we're looking at stretching, we're looking at some form of heel cushion to cushion the, the, the foot. Um, physiotherapy, sometimes physios use some strap, strapping, which can help, and some other anti-inflammatory modalities. You know, the rolling on the ice and so on. Now, if this doesn't help after a reasonable period, at least I ask my patients to, to um, come back to me in a month's time, tell me whether this treatment works. If it works, then we continue with it for as long as it takes until the pain goes away completely. It can take two to three months. It can. If we find that they reach a stage where there's a plateau, they don't get any better, or they're getting worse again, 
Then I'll go to my second stage. And let's call it semi-invasive. All right? That's where my injections come in, the hydrocortisone, the platelet-rich plasma, and the shockwave therapy. All right. So I try the shockwave therapy, and I don't do it myself. I send it to the sports physicians or the physios. Some of them do shockwave therapy. And some of them swear by it. That means the patients. And some don't find it very helpful. They find it very painful sometimes. But then I give them the choice of the injections as well. And I give them the whole um, uh, lecture that I've, that I've spoken to you about the PRPs and the cortisone. The cortisone is an anti-inflammatory. It works very differently to the platelet-rich plasma. Platelets have got healing potential. They work very differently. They are safer because it's the patient's own plasma. Um, we can give up to three in a month. Whereas cortisone, I give a once-off. So I, I tell the patient, that's my second stage. Along the way, if I find that the, that the, 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 the heel cord, the gastroxoleus complex is very tight, I may consider a night splint that will keep the, uh, the, uh, the ankle dorsiflexed overnight. Don't have to worry too much about stretching um, as well. Obviously, they have to do that during the day. If that doesn't work, now we're looking about five, six months down the line, and the patient is desperate, then we're looking at surgery. So thankfully, only about 5% come to surgery, and the results are pretty good at that stage. I find that if one does surgery prematurely, somehow the results are not as good. But if the patient has gone through this whole um, non-surgical route and is still symptomatic, I find the results are much better. Then, of course, with, with surgery, one has to... Um, be absolutely sure that you release what you need to release. Um, besides releasing the plantar fascia insertion and excising the scarred portion, one wants to make sure that the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve is not trapped. That's Baxter's uh, um, uh, nerve. And in, in fact, nowadays, I even go as far as doing a tarsal tunnel release as well. So I don't use a little mini incision, put a knife in there and just cut. All right? so, so it's not a small operation. I think, I think the patient has earned it. If they've been through all this non-surgical protocol under my, my care or my instructions, then when they finally reach surgery, then I will include a tarsal tunnel release, make sure all the nerves are released as well as the plantar fascia. So this right. is how I approach plantar fasciitis. So it's... Um, it's important to understand the problem. You know, um, patients come to me and they say, I've got a spur. They want the spur out. And once trying to explain to them, often, in fact, more often it's a misconception that the spur one sees and feel like a canal spur is in fact the cause of the pain. Um, the short flexes to the toes attached, there's a traction spur. You know, most people have it. But the plantar fasciitis on the middle tuberosity of the sculpts is usually the cause of the pain. And that's important for the patient to understand that as well. Right, just a quick, we're going to spend four more minutes on questions and we're going to close off. So just a quick one. Quinolones, how long does the antibody cause negative effects on the Achilles tendon? Do you have any answer for that question? Um, as far as I know, even three months quinolone intake prior to the tendonitis, it can still be quinolone, even longer than that, even up to four or six months. Um, often the patients can't quite remember when they took the antibiotic, which happens to be one of the quinolones. Um, so a few months, in fact, prior to presenting with tendonitis, which can be very severe and bilateral. It can be it's actually quite, quite, uh, uh, quite debilitating. And, um, and I often tell my patients, do give my patients quinolones. If I have to, if I find that is the best drug, I tell them about the possibility of tendonitis. Try not to do anything, anything strenuous. Don't exert themselves you know, for, for a while. Whether it helps or not, I don't know. But I do warn them about quinolones. I think it's important that one does. I'm going to try and put the last few together. There was a mention about the peasant's foot being the best shape for a dancer, but it's wider and gives more stability. So how does this pair with most dancing shoes that are typically narrow, tight, and restrictive? Yeah. So it's if a problem. you think it leads to bunions, the question is, when would you operate on bunions? Um, and what would you suggest? 
Um, and how soon after bunion surgery would you allow Belladonna back into her on-point shoes? Sure. All right. When operate on bunions, when they become symptomatic. That's it. All right. Done. Good answer. When do, they, <laughs> when do they go back to dancing? You know, this is, this is very individual. Um, the, first, the first three months is not negotiable. All right. Uh, the first six weeks, they are offloading the forefoot. The next six weeks, they're going back to normal activities. And then only they're going to start training. So ballpark figure, even if I say six months might be too soon, because sometimes swelling can last up to eight months to a year. They won't even fit in the ballet shoes, let alone going on points. So it's not, it's not any, so the, the best answer there is leave the bunions. Bunions, they, they can manage with them rather than having the surgery for a quick fix. So a serious ballet dancer, unless, unless it's, uh, it's very problematic, the bunion, and really, really interferes with their profession and their quality of life in general than what one would operate. But we warn them that it can take up to a year to go back on point in the way we were before. All right. So just a quick answer. Bev Ruiz, one of the best ultrasonographers in town, um, who does lots of foot and ankle ultrasonography, says that she not infrequently sees plantar fibromatosis. Do you have a protocol for treatment of those? If I'm convinced that it is plantar fibromatosis, and again, we can only say 99.9% .9 because the 0.1% can be something else and we only know about from histology. But generally, uh, again, only if it becomes symptomatic. Sometimes they become very large, multinodular. They, they may interfere with shoes. And um, uh, in fact, I had, I had a patient the other, the other day who complained of of the arch collapsed and turned out to be a, a plantar fibroma. Um, so if it becomes that size and symptomatic, be it tender or interfering with shoes and walking, I would excise out, I would leave it. And yeah. to me, mental anguish can be as important as physical anguish. If the patient is very, very concerned about what that might be, then I say, well, the only way we'll know is by excising it. And it's not the same as, uh, as Dupatrons where we excise the entire fascia, there we, we do a local excision with a good healthy margin of the plantar fascia around it. And I must say, I haven't seen any, any subsequent ruptures or anything like that doing, doing the, the excision, the local excision. So the last question, and uh, I think it's a great one to end off on. And you spoke about pain being an alarm bell that needs to be listened to. But dancers, like most sportsmen, have very high pain, not actually not yeah. most sportsmen, some sportsmen have a high pain threshold. Yeah. How do you distinguish good pain from bad pain? And uh, I think that's how if I, if, I does, if, I, if I does this, she's got pain, she has pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a difficult question. They're very they're difficult patients to treat because they've got a high pain threshold. And, um, and as a lot of other high profile athletes, you know, they, it, it's very important to them to go back and they tolerate a lot of pain. So when they finally come to you with pain, then we, I take it very seriously. And then I, I then see what the problem is. And of course, I, I minimize, well, as much as possible, try and, and find an effective way of treating it um, with minimal, let's call it, resting from the, the various professions. So yeah, it's a difficult question. I, I, you know, so, you know pain is so a very I, subjective thing, as you know. So I think, uh, if we were teaching first year registrars in orthopedics, any night pain or pain at rest is severe pain and something that you want to worry about. Yes. But in the sportsman, as Nick says, and I think I agree, generally the patient who gets to your rooms, normally by themselves, if they're brought in by somebody else, often there might be other agendas, but if they come in themselves telling you they're in pain, often they're in pain. So yeah. I just want to, with that, say thank you so much to Prof. Nick Saragus. Um, you gave us a great, introduction, covered the topics, and then we fired them at you for a good 45 minutes of questions and answers. A really great webinar. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you, and I hope everyone who listened tonight uh, got something out of it, and uh, our dancers will be better off for it. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. John, I see you here. You want to uh, end off? I'll, I'll end off uh, 
again by just repeating the thanks to Prof Saragus. Uh, I think one of the signs of a, of a good talk are the number of questions that come afterwards and the interaction that's generated. And as Brad said, you really face the firing squad there. We've had 25 of these webinars so far and I've never seen someone take so many questions. So thanks for that. I think it provoked a lot of good interaction and thought from a wide range of different disciplines, which is great to see that you had the surgeons and the physicians and the physios and the biokineticists and the podiatrists all listening in and, and giving their opinions and on, uh, asking questions. So thank you for that. Uh, it really was a great uh, overview of uh, issues in the, in the dancer's foot and we thank you for the time in, in preparing that. Uh, really, thanks very much for, for your time this evening, uh, Nick, uh, and, and also to Brad for for fielding the questions and for managing to bring it all together so nicely. We appreciate your input and your time, not only to this webinar, but to WISH as well. And again, to echo your thanks to Asino and Lita Group, uh, who are a pharmaceutical company who have supported WISH this year. We're very grateful to them. They have a suite of products, including Zifo, which is known to many of us. So thanks very much for your support as a company in supporting ongoing educational initiatives. To all the foot clinicians out there, there will be another foot orientated talk early September, focusing on the runner's foot and running shoes. So don't forget to look out for that. I think in the first week of September, you'll receive the adverts to that uh, and, and just sign up for that webinar. And we have a number of other webinars coming up covering our diverse range of topics. So, if you're on our database, you'll continue to receive those. Stay on the line. You'll be, be uh, linked to a, um, a survey. And from that, you'll be able to get your CPD points, uh, as you can see on the screen there. So as you log off, you should receive a pop-up and you will be receiving your CPD certificate in the next couple of weeks. So on behalf of VIT Sport and Health, thanks very much to all of you for tuning in. Thanks to our guest speaker, Prof. Saragus. Thanks to Dr. Galbart and Dr. Sagas for being in the background. And we look forward to our next webinar next week, which is looking at the athlete's mind uh, and how to develop a winning mind with the right support team around you. We've got some great uh, Olympic uh, mental health experts who are going to help us tell us a little bit about the winning mind. So join our sports psychology interest group who will be hosting that one. It's bound to be very interesting. So very good evening to you all. Uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you.